Yeah, some questions come up in the last study period. I'd like to answer this point. We're talking about the last study period. We were talking about the four letter of the tablets in the sanctuary and the, uh, the need for that. And so I would like to have that need more detail and more clearly put. Ready. I'd like to begin by taking a great comment. Does somebody have the book? Oh, I have it. Okay.
all need a knowledge for themselves as a position and work of their great high priest. So ask yourself right now, at this point in time, do you clearly understand the subject of the sanctuary and the investigative judgment? If you don't, you're in trouble. You're in very serious trouble. Because the next sentence says, otherwise it will be impossible for them to exercise the faith of the this time or to occupy the district of the design of the will. <coughs> now, if we can't exercise the faith which is essential at this time, what's our faith going to be? Eternal life, which means to be lost eternally. Okay, not just eternal life, it'll be to be lost eternally, because you get some eternal life to still make the kingdom. And you will not be able to occupy the position which God designs us to fill. So then, if we're weak in this thing, what must, what must we do? Strengthen ourselves in that By diligent study and so on. It is of the utmost importance, and what is more important than the utmost importance? Nothing, right? <coughs> that all should thoroughly investigate these subjects and be able to give an answer to everyone and ask them the reason and the hope which is in them. Now, Seventh day Adventism, which is what we are, right? We are, we are not a new branch of them, so that we are Seventh day Adventists, the true ascent of the word, was built on the sanctuary message, built on the 2000 day prophecy. And you can't claim to be an Adventist unless you understand the same thing in the great and final day of atonement. Come back to the end of the 8th chapter a moment to uh, note together the words of God there to his people. And uh, note what the man of sin would do when he came against the people of God. So read please from verse 9 down to verse 12. And out of one of them came forth a little horn, which waxed exceeding great towards the south, and towards the east, and towards the pleasant land. And it waxed great, even to the host of heaven, and it cast down some of the hosts, and of the stars to the ground, and stamped upon them. Yea, he magnified himself even to the prince of the host, and by him the daily sacrifice was taken away, and the place of his sanctuary was cast down. And a host was given him against the daily sacrifice by reason of transgression. And it cast down the truth to the grave, and it practiced and prospered. Thank you very much. <coughs> Good, now who is this little horn power? It's Babylon. First of all, the old pagan form, and then the papal form. And as this horn grew in power, it went to war against the people of God, treating down the people of God themselves, and wasting the glorious land of the church. He would do three things. He would exalt himself as high as the prince of the host, by the day he would be taken away, and the place in his sanctuary was cast down. Now, every single time down through history when God, God spoke of being overcome by satanic forces, what have those forces always done? Remove the daily, cast down the sanctuary, and travel upon the people of God. Yeah. In reference to the same verse, would you explain the difference between taking away the daily and casting down the sanctuary? I don't clearly see the distinction. Okay. The sanctuary itself in the old testament building. And the daily were the services in connection with that building. So the end of time of life as the building, which in this case is a building of truth, the truth about the sanctuary. And the daily are the procedures we follow to appropriate the blessings of that building. So they're really one thing, they're not two separate lines of... No, they're, they're, they're two things, they're, 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 they're intimately connected with each other, right? So you can't, you can't take down one without taking down the other, then, can you? Can't, except, in the, except the building can remain empty and hollow, right. which it did, of course, in Christ's day, when, they, uh, when Christ came to Jerusalem and saw the temple was empty. Which effectively takes out... Daily too, though, on a spiritual level. Definitely, no, it was gone completely. Totally gone. Although they did offer sacrifices still, but they were also empty in point of means. Back in Daniel's day, of course, both the daily and the temple were, were taken away. It was cast in ruins at that time. Very good then. Now, I don't plan today, of course, to give you a comprehensive presentation of the sanctuary service, but we'll make some main points in regard to it so that we can at least get some kind of a foundation for this great service. 
You mentioned before there were four tables, one in the courtyard, one in the holy place, one in the most holy place, and one in the scapegoat. Do you have references for those? Read, read, read the book, uh, God's Way in the Second Book, please, right? Okay. Now, what did the atonement in the courtyard accomplish? Transfer the sin from the sinner to the sanctuary. Yes, and paved the way for that. Let's first of all let's first of all look at the daily sin offering, which is not an individual offering, but we want the entire encampment. And this atonement, or well, the daily sin offering, was made for all the people and provided what? A mantle of covering. Covering. Um, a mantle of covering. It was imputed righteousness, which which effectively save those folk from destruction and from the loss of God's favour. Then when the time came as an individual sin, he likewise came to the altar of sin offering and there he confessed his sin specifically over the victim. He teach of course and accept all confession. He had to confess about what he'd done and what he is. <coughs> and when he confessed what he was and gave that to Christ the Lamb, what he'd done and what was given up to Christ the Lamb, that he was empty, swept and garnished from the presence of the sinfulness, and into his place in the vacuum, of course, came the grace of the Holy Spirit, the new life altogether. So the atonement there cleansed the person and filled him with the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And the sin was now moved to the holy place of the sanctuary, which is the second atonement. Now, although it, although it moved there, the the sinner did not escape the possible ultimate condemnation of the law. Let's turn to page 518, for instance, a great controversy. And this, of course, is a 40 page for some people, especially uh, outside of this movement. Page 418, I think is correct. Let's read first of all on page 4 and 8 the paragraph which starts to demonstrate the earth is actually consists of two divisions. So go ahead, please. The ministration of the earthly sanctuary consisted of two divisions. The priests ministered daily in the holy place, while once a year the high priest performed a special work <coughs> of atonement in the most holy for the cleansing of the sanctuary. Day by day the repentant sinner brought his offering to the door of the tabernacle and placing his hand upon the victim's head, confessed his sins, thus in figure transferring them from himself to the innocent sacrifice. The animal was then slain. Without shedding of blood, says the apostle, there is no remission of sin. The life of the flesh is in the blood. Leviticus 17.11 The broken law of God demanded the life of the transgressor, the blood representing the forfeited life of the sinner, guilt the victim bore was carried by the priest into the holy place and sprinkled before the veil, behind which was the ark containing the law that the sinner had transgressed. By this ceremony, the sin was, through the blood, transferred in figure to the sanctuary. In some cases, the blood was not taken into the holy place, but the flesh was then to be removed <coughs> by the priest, as Moses directed the sons of Aaron, saying, God hath given it you to bear the iniquity of the congregation. Leviticus 10.17 Those ceremonies alike symbolize the transfer of the sin from the penitent to the sanctuary. Thank you very much. This portrays very clearly in object lesson form the procedures to be followed by Jew and attend by ourselves of course these last days when sin appears in our lives needs to be dealt with for a bit of. Now I ask you a simple question. Could God have more plainly shown what must be done than he has, he has in his, his object lesson form? He couldn't, could he? He's very kind to us. And he's given to us a very clear picture of the procedure we have to follow. Now note that the forward life of the sinner is transferred to the sanctuary, which of course is much more than just the guilt or the obligation of sin. The life is the very disposition of spirit of sin himself. Now when a person comes and appropriates this blessing and follows this procedure through, to what extent does that sin removed from him? Totally. Totally, right? There is therefore now no condemnation in which in Christ Jesus, Romans 8, verse 1. Very well, let's turn to page 420 in the same book, Great Copy, you see. And uh, read this time, 
Assembly's important truths concerning the Tamil Nadu political service. Important truth concerning the atonement of taught by the Jibbutal servants substitute was accepted in sin instead, but the sin was not cancelled by the blood of the victim. The means was thus provided by which it was transferred to the sanctuary. By the offering of blood, the sinner acknowledged the authority of the law, confessed his guilt in transgression, and expressed his desire to pardon through faith in the Redeemer to come. But he was not yet entirely released from the condemnation of the law. Good, let's talk to him about it, we can begin later. We have a nice little white book which I'll use to illustrate the point we just read here. We don't have an easel, unfortunately, but we can manage just to cheer with a hold of it. Yes, okay. That's good, right. Now, this is a familiar picture, of course, the two apartment sanctuary with the holy and most holy place. Around about the whole thing, of course, was the courtyard. Now, here is the sinner at the teaching civil confession. And in this man's heart is the actual sinfulness or the evil which must be got rid of. There's his sin. And that must be revealed to him before he can confess and put it away. So first of all, he must know his sin. So God comes against him or comes to him the ministry of the Holy Spirit or some other means, such as temptation and whatnot. And that man comes to see what is in himself and what he actually is in himself. And wherever he goes, it goes with him. Now the believer in Jesus Christ who has been born again now comes to the sanctuary and at the altar of sacrifice in the court he confesses over the victim of the sin which is then totally and completely transferred, placed in the holy place of the, of the sanctuary. In our case, of course, the heavenly sanctuary. Now as Sister White said, which we've just written, even though the sin has been totally transferred from that man to the sanctuary, it is still not cancelled. The cancelled is still there. Right? It's still there. It's not been obliterated or gone out of existence. It's still there. And it remained there until the great day of final atonement when it will be moved upon the scapegoat or go back on the sinning himself, as the case may be. Now, let's go to Matthew chapter 18, I believe it to be, at the moment. And read a parable that many folk find hard to understand. This, this is the story of the unjust servant who robbed his master and then persecuted the man that led the forgiveness from him. Matthew chapter 18. I sat before Pentecostalists and Roman people and so forth and argued this chapter with them without much, without much success, of course. I made the chapter 18 starts with verse 21. Could someone like to read please verse 21 down to verse 35. Then Peter came to him and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times? Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to seventy times seven. Therefore the kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. And when he had begun to settle accounts, one was brought to him who owed him ten thousand talents. But as he was not able to pay, his master commanded that he be sold, his wife and children, and all that he had, and that payment be made. The servant therefore fell down before him, saying, Master, have patience with me, and I will pay you all. Then the master of that servant was moved with compassion, released him, and forgave him the debt. But that servant went out and found one of his fellow servants, who owed him a hundred denarii. And he laid hands on him and took him by the throat, saying, Pay me what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down at his feet and begged him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay you all. And he would not, but went and threw him into prison till he should pay the debt. So when his fellow servants saw what had been done, they were very grieved and came and told their master all that had been done. Then his master, after he had called him, said to him, You wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you begged me. Should you not also have had compassion on your fellow servant, just as I had pity on you? 
And his master was angry and delivered him to the torturers until he should pay all that was due to him. So my heavenly Father also will do to you if each of you from his heart does not forgive his brother his trespasses. Yeah, this is this part of these great spiritual truth which can't be mistaken. They went to these king's servants down to O. Uh, which one, the first one? 10,000 talents, yeah. 10,000 talents, which today is something like $17 million, some debt. What have that man been paying that debt? None. He would never, ever accumulate the wealth required to pay that debt. There's just no hope of that. So who does that sort of represent? Us. Us, right. I mean, we can't pay the debt that we owe to God because of our sins. Now, when the king purposed to judge him and condemn him and, and uh, punish him, the servant then pleaded for mercy in time to pay the king and his compassion granted that time and forgave that debt unconditionally, as we, as we can say, to what extent? Totally. Totally. Absolutely totally. That was as free as we never had a penny at all. But there was a conditional factor, as the story revealed, that when this man went out to pay, another person owed him a few, a few dollars, about, I think about $17 altogether. Just a mere pittance compared to his forgiveness. He showed an unforgiving spirit toward that man and showed in himself he was unqualified to share the king's kingdom with the king. <clears throat> because how could that man, with a selfish, grasping spirit, share the kingdom with a king who had a, a forgiving, merciful spirit? His job was numbers altogether, right? And then the king rolled the debt back upon that man as if he had never been forgiven at all. As if he'd never been forgiven at all, that's the important point. And then Jesus said, So likewise, what will, what will happen? Read the last verse of the chapter. So my heavenly Father also will do to each of you, if from his heart he does not forgive his brother his trespasses. Which comes out of the Court of Great Controversy, page 519, from 420, where it's twice they were entitled to the least in the of the law. Come to the sanctuary then. Here is the unjust Jewess in his heart who comes and asks for forgiveness and judgment. His sin is transferred from him to the sanctuary born by the king himself and his son. But he doesn't show forgiveness for his fellow servant, so this sin then, which still exists, is then placed back upon him once more. And bear in mind, God is not a destroyer, is he? So therefore, God does not destroy sin in the sanctuary. That sin is still a living entity up there held captive until the great day of final atonement. But it still exists. All your sins are still existing, every one of them. They either upon you still, I hope or not, or up in the sanctuary. Now, on the great day of atonement, Christ then makes atonement for all that sin on the basis of our performance down here upon the earth. Now, we may ask the question, why does God do this once again? It's a reflection of his merciful, loving character. God will never force you to be a Christian. And how many folk we've seen who begin well but don't last too long? You know, God makes provision for those folk to get their sins back again because obviously, if they go so far and drop out, what is their declaration as far as their past sins are concerned? They love them more than they love Christ. And you know, Christ is okay. You can love them more than you can have them. You can't have them at the same time. So God simply keeps them in a bank under custody until such time as the final decision is made by the person, then they either go upon that person again or they go onto the step as the case may be. So Christ enters the most holy place with the blood of the, of the uh, final talent lamb. He sprinkles that blood upon the mercy seat and around the mercy seat seven times. He, he steps out and gathers up the sin in, in the holy place and takes it and puts it upon the stranger. Now, let me emphasize the point here. Absolutely no sin can ever pass direct from us to the scapegoat. It must go to the sanctuary. It must. No, there's no getting around that. And if in the great day of Father told you found a sin still in you and, and the door is closed up here, what's your fate? You're lost. Absolutely lost. We need to know that's paper and clearly and plain. Right? Now, that's a very brief summary, of course, of the sanctuary service. We spent many years on that great theme that we want to lay out, of course. Now, I've come to a difficult statement which has been a puzzle for some people, a statement which is probably back at the moment. In the book of the morning, it describes the 
pausing in Christ and the holy place of the heavenly sanctuary after his feast is mentioned in the most holy place. Christ 
gathers up the sins of the whole place, believes and brings the wicked right down to the earth, and they're placed upon Satan, who bears the weight of the distant place. Now, how do we reconcile that? We might look at that picture, and the answer is quite simple, actually. Now, in the Bible and the spirit of prophecy, you quite often encounter a run of events, and then a, a, a backtracking to take up other events prior to that point. Let's go to Revelation chapter 18 from that, for instance, shall we? Revelation chapter 18. And uh, verse 1. So read it, please. And after these things, I saw another angel come down from heaven, and had a great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. Good. Now let's see what it doesn't say. It does not say, and after these things, another angel came down. It says, I saw another angel come down. Does that make a difference? It does, because Revelation chapter 17 is the sixth and seventh plagues in particular, which come after Revelation chapter 18. Yet the Bible describes Revelation chapter 17 first, and then it says, after these things. And the impression you get, of course, is that after these, after these things, these things happen. But after these things, you saw them happen. See, see my argument? There's a big difference. Then we know perfectly well, of course, that the plagues of chapter 16 and the chapters of chapter 15 all occur in furthermore that these three angels of Revelation, the last two angels of Revelation chapter 14, all occur after Revelation chapter 18, that way. Now, if, if, if John had written, after these things I, just read it, after these things another angel came down, then we have to put Revelation 18 way over beyond the plague, didn't we? Can't do that. Now, in like manner, in early writing, we find the same expression of I saw, making a big difference in how we interpret this particular statement. Put that plate again, Bill. No, we waited. 280 to 
the religious people. That's the usual interpretation, but that, that's not a real time. It was a great controversy. No, I couldn't figure out right. like, how the world was going to do this, you know. Now, if you, if you, if you we reread it, though, every case decided, Christ tells you, man, goes up the sins, comes to this earth, and puts them on the scapegoat. Then this is the way that backtrack, backtracks is that they are so important as keeping your time. And then he grabbed us up as people. Yeah. The words that I saw are the key which, which indicates a break in the sequence. In other words, now, in other words, this is why they're showing a sequence of events. Which were? Number one, number two, and number three, out here in the courtyard. And he just talks about those three events and leaves out in the in-between just those three major cardinal events. Then, she says, then I saw, and the mind is carried back to heaven again, where she saw Christ put upon his, uh, his kidney road, which was really event number three. Does he go back to heaven then? No, 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 no. Sister White does. Oh, she does. Yeah, she was saying she saw. Yeah, in other words, first of all, God showed her, let's go into Revelation again. Revelation chapter 14, God first of all showed us seven angels, or six angels. Then Revelation 16, the plagues. Revelation 17, more of the plagues. Revelation chapter 18, after these things, I saw. So now carried right back again. And like man, the sister white, saw the first event, the second event, the third event, in her secret, and she was carried back, and then she said, then I saw. Christ probably his kingly robes. Yes, Kimba. Sort of like a, she saw the beginning of the event, she saw the end of the event, and then she was carried back to the middle of the event to see something else that took place during it, right? That's oh. the easiest way to perceive it, I think. Doesn't mean it actually In that sequence, That's right. right. I think there's a question over here. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, you made the comment that the old view was that he went into the holy place, placed the sins on the scapegoat, then changed his garments and came to this earth. But it said he changes his garment and then puts the sins on the scapegoat here on this earth. Okay. Yeah. I, um, this is the problem I'm having, and I'm trusting it's only an apparent contradiction because I don't have an answer yet. But if you read Leviticus 16, which tells about the Day of Atonement, it specifically says in uh, verse 21, no, 20, that when he's made an end of reconciling the holy place, then it goes, verse 21, he lays his hands on the live goat. Verse 22, the goat is sent away. Verse 23, he changes his garment. Right. So somewhere there's an apparent contradiction here that there's a beautiful truth that must be found here somewhere that we're not yet seeing. We well can't known. cast the one away. Yeah. Well, no, just to be able to track on this quite well. There's only a question. I think the answer, that was Leviticus 16, 21 to 23, is that? 20 through 23. Okay. In 23, where he comes in and changes his garments, that's because he's finished the work of representing Christ to the people there. He's finished the work of the high priest there, and so he goes back, and it's over now. That's the end of the ceremony, and he goes back and... Uh, for lack of a better term, takes off the costume that si signifies him as Christ and puts on his regular pe priestly attire again. Well, does he put on this kingly robe? Well, we're talking about the typical <laughs> not Christ. When Christ leaves the heavenly sanctuary, puts his kingly robe on, then puts his kingly robe on the stage after that. In the Old Testament type, he was still in his priestly robe, he put the sin on the scapegoat, and then changed after that. It has to be that one, that's really why. Because in the Old Testament we have only the Aaronic priesthood, not the Melchizedek. And that is a time up until Christ ends his work in the most holy place. Then obviously he must put his king of Rome, must think he's now a Melchizedek king. It's quite as simple as that. Bear in mind that types are not always accurate in every respect. They teach certain great truths, they don't teach every fine detail we'd like them to do at times. For instance, in the last lecture we looked at the clay in the potter's hand, and in the type which was the clay in the potter's hand, the potter makes the choice. In the 
and a dial. The client makes the choice. Does that? When we're at this thing, this puzzling thing, what are the garments of vengeance? Well, they see the fact that the guys will then come down and be able to show it from the right off. It doesn't mean he himself will be Oh, I see. The shelter of his hands. They've got priests shelter, but the king doesn't. Any further questions? Yes, Tina. Well, then we see here a picture of Christ's blood as basically the vehicle to transfer sin from one origin to another. Precisely. To another. And even from heaven to the scapegoat. That's right. Therefore, sin itself is transitory all the way to scapegoat or back to us, depending on the choice of the body.